Thank you very much, uh, Carly, for the introduction. And it's uh, really a pleasure to have been invited to share with you some of uh, my research. Um, my, my aim today is actually to invite us to think together about the shared goals and aims of movements for media democracy, which is the area of my research, and open access movements and related movements in your arena. We face new challenges of information warfare and propaganda, information overload and attention economies. As you folks know well, transparency and access to information doesn't ensure interpretability or being able to make sense of all that is accessible to us. So given the current digital and information landscape, how might we share strategies of interventions and use to quote Audre Lorde, use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. Our two movements share commitments to participatory democracy, to open and engaged public spheres. We share concerns about how to intervene in corporate proprietary ownership of information and news. And so to catalyze this conversation, I want to offer highlights from my research into digital dissent and how activists have used digital technologies and social media in the interest of democracy. So your abstract talks more about my recent, uh, my current research. Um, having looked into some of what you're talking about today, um, I, I felt this was more appropriate to focus on this. But um, briefly, I'll just point out some of the challenges we face in the current landscape which is what I'm trying to figure out right now. Um, as we know, um, many are describing this current context of information warfare, which I talk about as the affective politics of information warfare as an era of post-truth crisis. And post-truth was defined and was uh, determined to be the word of the year in uh, 2016 defined as circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And Stephen Colbert, who I'll be referencing later, in uh, 2005 um, made popular the term truthiness. So this concern about uh, how emotion shapes opinion and is used as the basis for um, disseminating information was raised quite a long time ago. And I think that's one of the themes of what I'll be sharing with you today is how many of the crises we are uh, encountering today were, were glimpsed uh, much earlier in, in our activist period using digital media. So some of these challenges that concern me today, um, uh, the, the phrases that some use to talk about information warfare is uh, the, the race to um, the bottom of the brainstem, to our amygdala and the emotions, et cetera, and the capacity to hack attention with emotional packaging. So um, what particularly what concerns me is the way in which behavioral psychology and big data are working together um, for these forms of, of warfare as I see them. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about that in, uh, in our Q&A, but I definitely want there to be time for that Q&A for us to think together about our, our movements. So I think it's helpful to think about the history of Web 2.0 as these three sort of epics. And the first uh, I date from 2000 to 2010 approximately as the, the early halcyon days of participatory web. The second I would characterize as the Twitter revolution and the hopes for digital democracy. And the third I've just, um, I've just described a bit. So I began my own concern with these and my own observations. I was a scholar um, of, I am a scholar studying uh, the politics of emotion, but I was living in the belly of the beast in uh, 2000, 2001. Uh, in Virginia, I was working at Virginia Tech in the United States. Um, I, I hail from San Francisco, but at that time, um, uh, in the wake of the very contested election of uh, George W. Bush in 2000 and then the events of September 11th, there was a very um, palpable crisis regarding the role of news and media. And interestingly, uh, it was a coincidence of this crisis of public faith in truth-telling 
along with the rise of Web 2.0. And what that meant was we began really a new era of the capacity to intervene and the capacity to provide new narratives and new, new um, ways of thinking about what was counting as truth. So what struck me at that time was that there were these increased demands on the part of the public for truthful accounts from politicians and media. And um, simultaneously, though not everyone was going to call themselves a postmodernist or what have you, but a paradoxical sense that truth was being constructed with the result that the only certainty was we're living in this kind of irony that we are being lied to. So these were the, this was the general climate um, that provoked my particular interest in, in these issues. So of course, these questions of um, were there weapons of mass destruction or were there weapons of mass distraction, as it were, um, were, were really focalized in this particular historical moment. And one of the um, concerns was that, that activists would share with me when I then moved to uh, Canada in 2003 to the University of Toronto and uh, began a research, the first research project I'll talk to you about around digital dissent. Um, there was a sense that there was information to be had, but the question was for activists the issue of how to interpret it. So one, one uh, person told me everyone had a different opinion of what was wrong, of why the US was attacked, what we needed to fix, who we needed to attack, what the situation is. I'm a patriot, he said. I don't want to be seen as somebody who's against my country and against protecting ourselves, but this is the information we're given. They might have weapons of mass destruction, so it gets tricky. So this, uh, in these interviews, I was speaking with people from across um, both sides of the spectrum, and you see that, that that sense of how do we interpret the information we're given uh, was, was early on a concern. So another piece of the background context was in 2003, a Florida Supreme Court ruling that the news is not, in fact, required to tell the truth. And it's something I, I feel we often um, overlook today, but uh, I recommend the, the corporation, the documentary, The Corporation, to, to um, uh, if you want further context about that particular uh, court ruling. So as you recall, um, perhaps this statement that was made in 2004 by an aide, uh, a Bush aide, tell, speaking to journalists, saying, this isn't the way the world works anymore. He says, we're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you, meaning journalists and folks like us, study that reality judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and all of you will be left to study what we do. So those were, the, those were the, some of the background context for that sense of irony and, um, and a sense of uh, the importance of intervening in those traditional uh, news media narratives. So what I did once I came to Canada, a project like this certainly would not have been funded in the United States at that time. Um, yes. Uh, and. By the way, I really wonder how seriously Canada is taking the questions of um, this information warfare, for example, related to the upcoming election in uh, 2019. I, I'm concerned, so I hope we can talk about that, but I, I'm not seeing enough concern in Canada about the tactics we are observing in the US and, and how those will infiltrate here as well. In any event, in uh, 2005 here in Canada, I wanted to ask um, what were the motivations for online digital dissent, political engagement? Um, did it give people a sense of public voice and political efficacy? And to what extent was frustration with mainstream media one of the motivations? And just briefly, the, the material that I looked at were four primary sites. Online networks about The Daily Show, I was really interested, and I'll speak to that in a minute, about how parody and satire was being used as a particular strategy to intervene in these narratives. So I spoke with people who were producing uh, networks or websites 
websites related to the politics of The Daily Show. The Move On had done a contest uh, called Bush in 30 Seconds and had received 150 um, uh, independently produced videos that were essentially um, sort of fake ads, or I mean they were ads against uh, the election of Bush in 2004. And so I interviewed the people who had produced those, then independently produced viral videos and political blogs that were addressing the US invasion, illegal invasion of Iraq. So um, the, the key findings really in terms of those initial questions were that indeed people were motivated by wanting to be heard or make a statement anger and frustration with current events and how the news was representing those events, the desire to influence others, and particularly elections, and a desire to offer a corrective function to counter media. So I'm just going to share with you a few of the ways that people um, characterized what they saw the problem being within the, the traditional or mainstream media. Uh, one person said to me, giving and receiving spin is not the job of the news media. So to, to date, this is 2005, right? This, it's not their job to repeat. It's their job to report and to analyze and take various pieces of evidence and fact and put them all together in a way to make the situation make sense. Not so much just go to a briefing and then type it up. And what I noticed <laughs> was that this phrase of making sense started to um, come about in many of the interviews, that there was in this um, uneasy relationship to what counted as truth, that people were starting to talk instead about how to make sense of things. Others were very concerned with the repetition of lies. So um, at this point, uh, Fox News was much newer on the horizon. And folks would say things like, it's one lie after another. So I mean, there's some truth in there. But they manage, like Rush Limbaugh, he's extremely clever. He'll tell part of a truth and then spin it the way he wants to spin it. Everyone goes to the bar, drinks, and talks about it, and hears it on Fox News and believes it's true. So it was interesting that in 2005, People were already observing this particular um, cycle, on, particularly on the right. So how were, how were activists thinking about um, methods and strategies for intervening in dominant media narratives? One was to counteract or counter this misinformation with rational uh, facts and information. And then there were debates about whether it's more effective to persuade emotionally. And I think we're dealing with these issues still today. The other was the um, increasing use of remix, which I think is really uh, resonates with some of the concerns in, um, in, in the world that you folks work in, in terms of repurposing and reappropriating information. And the use of parody and satire, which I think is another way of doing, doing uh, what remix does. So just to speak to that first issue um, of, of uh, using information or emotion, bloggers in particular, of all the folks I spoke to, so there were video producers, bloggers, et cetera, the bloggers had a, a particular, were particularly wedded to ideals of democracy in a traditional sense, um, dialogue and debate across partisan lines, and a hope that truth could be, could be found through this um, sort of agonistic debate and a deliberative kind of dialogue. Uh, one thing that struck me, though, was that while some really saw a process of debate and dialogue as being important, other folks would describe it in this pluralistic sense that I think is something we encounter today, and that is uh, what we call the Walmart model of democracy, where there's all of this information at hand, and you can just choose which brand you like, right? I think this is a real concern. But it was really interesting that early on, people saw those different uh, strategies. So do you fight misinformation with counterinformation? One woman said to me, basically, they've used 9-11 over and over again to promote a war on a country that didn't even attack us. And yet, how many people in the US still believe they attacked us? And this, these are quotes from different people noting the importance of what I was indicating at the beginning of the importance of our emotional or affective attachment to information. 
folks were saying, like me, the public didn't want to believe it. They wanted to believe that the people in power had our own best interest at heart and were protecting us. And another, since these things are just so hard to swallow, I think you have to coat them with sugar because people don't want to believe them. She's referring to alternative um, uh, versions, alternatives to the mainstream narrative. And then another, there's a huge number of people who just don't have a clue and don't want to have a clue. And we certainly encounter these, these questions today. Others were quite committed to notions of reason and truth. Um, this person uh, is on, on the right end of the political spectrum said, I have very strong opinions and feel very passionately, but the thing that matters most to me is not the feelings so much as the ideas and making sure that I try to be based in reason and truth as much as possible. And in contrast, another says, I just felt like throwing figures in people's faces. So her strategy was to use emotion. If I can throw these statistics and figures in people's faces while showing emotional scenes, there I'm going to stop them and make them say, wait a second. So this way of emotionally pulling them in, she says, I'm trying to use emotional impact and technique to try to get people to respond to the facts. Because facts are just facts. And there are too many of them out there. People are overwhelmed with information, so you have to figure out a way to get to them so they'll listen. So I wanted to draw our attention, as I mentioned, to the, the use of remix, which given the um, given digital technologies, obviously, is, is a visual means as well as, um, as a, a way of using any kind of information to do this particular kind of intervention. And I think that that was much more difficult prior to uh, digital, um, digital work. And uh, in this instance, what we see is, of course, so I wanted to mention also that, that we saw some really powerful examples of digital technologies being used to intervene in the kinds of propaganda that were um, being presented in mainstream news. So Abu Ghraib is obviously a really key example of that. So in this instance, there were protesters who performed Abu Ghraib in real life, and then there was a major campaign that used this image uh, from the iPod advertisements to, um, to intervene and, and use Remix to draw attention to the, to the scandal of Abu Ghraib. And let's see if this um, plays. Um, another example, there's so many really interesting examples of Remix, but um, this one I, f I found particularly interesting. And this was somebody literally in their pajamas in a basement, the classic vision we have of how this stuff gets produced. And, um, and once he, uh, he posted this video, it was so overwhelmed with traffic that it, um, it crashed. And so it was only up briefly. And now we can access it. But uh, let's see if this plays. Yeah. yeah. Good day. Space bar. I had September that. 11th. September 11th. September 11th. September 11th. September 11th, 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 September 11th, September 11th. September 11th, September 11th. September 11th. September 11th, September 11th, 2001. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Saddam 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 Hussein. Continuing danger, hour of danger. Very, very dangerous world. A grave new threat. Yeah. Horrific acts of atrocities. Murderous regimes dedicating to killing us. Tyranny and terror. Slaughtered thousands. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons programs. The deadliest of weapons. Terrible weapons. Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. 
poison gas, torture chambers, mass graves, deadly technologies, radical ideology of hate, terror of threats, terror, 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 war on terrorism, war against terrorism, global war on terror, global terrorism, 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 the evil terrorists. Terrorists, 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 terrorists. So in addition to using remix, um, the satire and parody was a very pop, became ex increasingly popular and um, had, there's many arguments about the value of satire, but uh, I happen to be of the camp that thinks it, it effectively brings truth to power in terms of biting up, as long as it's uh, biting up in, term, in uh, targeting those with power. Um, fomenting critical inquiry, a form of pre-politicization, and frequently creating a sense of community, at least uh, when, when those shows were being broadcast, they created massive online communities. So for example, in 2004, Jon Stewart appeared on Crossfire to absolutely call out what the news was doing in terms of mud, mud fights and, and wrestling um, instead of actual news. I mean, uh, Stewart's vision of democracy is very similar, really, to John Dewey. It's a, a notion that there is a responsibility of the media to inform citizens, and, um, and he was extraordinarily disappointed in the work that was being done on, on uh, cable shows of CNN and Fox, et cetera. So um, this was the top side of media event in the blogosphere in 2004, just watched um, extremely widely at the time and um, had great cross-partisan appeal. His main message was calling out the news to stop hurting America. The thing is, we need your help. You're helping the politicians and the corporations and we're left out there to mow our lawns. So some argued that this form, these forms of satire were breeding um, what they called the cynicism effect and lowering young voters' trust in national leaders. Others suggested that irony was rendering people politically impotent. And others suggested that this kind of satire was only amounting to chat around the water cooler. But in the research I was doing, I discovered that there were there were um, significant ways in which the satire was moving into the real world and having um, really significant effects in terms of changing the agenda setting in news. So shifting now to that second era of Web 2.0 that was often hailed as the Twitter revolution, et cetera, um, the use of these platforms for organizing networks in large-scale protests was just immense. And so in this second research project, I interviewed, uh, I ended up interviewing primarily women activists who were involved in the Occupy movement in uh, Canada and in the United States. And the real tension um, that, that, was, that folks were facing was around this question of can the master's tools dismantle the master's house? So, there was always a sort of um, sense of the contradictions and tensions of having a movement that was challenging economic inequality while using the master's tools, which this uh, cartoon draws attention to, right? Folks really had a sense that there was a need for an alternative fiber optic, fiber optic infrastructure, and there was a lot of discussion about that. At the same time, um, there was a much more acute awareness in this period than there had been earlier of the risks of surveillance. But there was kind of a coming to a, a sense of peace with that. Like, we are just going to openly organize and let the police see what we're doing to a great extent. And um, when there was a need to be off the radar of police or authorities, most of those meetings were, were clearly um, face to face. And here also a, a place in which uh, this movement and the strategies I think overlap with some of the interest in, in open access in terms of suvance or turning the, turning the media back. 
So one activist told me, in essence, being on the front lines and, and getting news media out there at the time, it was like we had infiltrated and we were actually seeing news speak happening. We the people can make our own news now. People are taking video of the cops beating up the people and the cops used to be taking the videos. So we've got this panopticon on both sides. We're all watching each other now, she told me. So there's really a double-edged sword of using the social media as this networking tool. I'm not going to take time to read this, but um, just the, the appreciation folks had of being able to use Facebook and Twitter. So in nine days, she had 900 friends. Um, thanks to Google Translate, she could read articles from all around the world. And it was the Occupy movement that got her into media and got her to have this sense of international, global um, community and sharing of news. One person says it was suddenly, media was suddenly a tool that was for the people and not something that was just going to be a watching, not just invasion of privacy. Suddenly it was a connector. We turn that around and we flip it. And what was private before is now a public mobilization tool and people are all becoming part of a movement because of a Facebook page. We've subverted something that was potentially damaging. So what I, what I found was that there were three main roles that people were taking up to, um, in terms of the social media, in terms of the digital media, and those were administrating, connecting, and documenting. And just briefly share with you um, what, what this entailed. So the administrator um, was primarily, um, was primarily uh, focusing on, on strategizing, for example. So this one woman says, I focus on what we put up and when. So she's speaking of Facebook, like rush hour between 8 and 9.30. That's the highest traffic we have. I always think if there's some really good thing, leave it for 8 AM. And I say, at noontime, people go to lunch. So I'm like, OK, people are going to be reading during this time. So I want to give them something that goes well with their food, usually political humor or critical thinking pieces could be good for that time. The documentarian, fairly uh, clear what, what that was, and I've, um, but this woman speaks about witnessing. One of the roles of the documentarian was simply to witness. You could see how the Los Angeles Police Department was saying, you guys stay here, okay, you guys go there, and they were doing this ballet orchestration of their media, but two blocks away, they're beating people, and the media wasn't allowed to go over there and see that. And then when they shot the guy in the treehouse, the media absolutely didn't show that. But the live streamers within the movement, she live streamed it and um, documented the guys in the treehouse who had killed, uh, shot at an activist. So the last a key role was the, the connector reaching out. And this, um, I thought folks here might appreciate this, this issue of information access. I did do a lot of the Twitter feed as far as information goes and online linking. And I tried to do so in several places because there is a huge technology gap. I asked people, well, have you seen this link? And they said, no. And then, where can I see it? I said, OK, we'll put it up on Twitter. I don't use Twitter. Then I'm like, OK, I'll put it up on Facebook. Well, I don't use Facebook. Then I'll email it to you. Well, I don't have an email. You know, So there's that gap of trying to get it to different people. And sometimes that even means just writing it down on a piece of paper and then looking it up in the local library. So in conclusion, I've wanted to share with you a few tidbits of the dilemmas and strategies engaged by activists committed to media and democracy, which reveal these really pressing tensions and contradictions. In an era of hyper surveillance and information overload, is there such a thing, I wonder, as too much transparency? How do we ensure that beyond transparency there's interpretability? And how do we work together to continue using master's tools to dismantle the master's house? What's on the, <clears throat> on the left side of the slide is, um, I wanted to close with this, the, the aims within media democracy. And I've spent some time before um, coming to speak with you thinking what are the parallel, um, what are the parallel strategies and goals within within your field that, that would parallel what's going on um, in terms of intervening in, in media um, narratives. 
And so just to close, I think these, these questions are ones we might think about, and you may have others, but I hope we can think together about the tactics and strategies of media democracy and open access movements, how they overlap and differ, and how these movements can learn from and support each other as we continue in this very urgent work of preserving participatory democracy. Thank you. So I asked, um, I asked to be stopped in plenty of time, I hope, for us to have some conversations. So. Oh, there's a microphone coming? Yep. Yeah. Here's a hand up here. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting and I think timely presentation for us today. Um, so I'm not from a library and information science background. I'm more from the digital technology for education area. I'm right here, hi. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to know um, how in the era of fake news we can kind of discern or how people are discerning or making sense of uh, you know, activist opportunities that are presented on social media. So for an example, uh, the New York Times just showed lots of different kinds of Facebook posts that were being used to try to propagate division in the very way that you show through emotionality. And a lot of those were actually linked to activist events and had activists quoting um, you know, kind of their experiences being, I had no idea this was a divisive strategy from a fake page that was sponsored by you know, people in Russia. And so how, how can folks tell what's a real opportunity for engagement or activism versus something that's actually uh, divisive or something that's sponsored by political operatives elsewhere? And I'm not sure that there is a direct answer, but I'm curious to know your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, one, of the, one of the directions of my current work is to think through what, what do media education and media literacy strategies need to look like in an era of fake news, right? And there's many, many uh, scholars and activists and et cetera who are onto this. Um, what, so you, you might have noticed that um, uh, in the wake of 2016, the New York Times uh, um, uh, sub banner reads, democracy dies in darkness and um, uh, that we are the truth. I mean, their advertising is all about truth and reason and similarly the Washington Post. So what I've noticed is that there's a return to um, sort of enlightenment values of rationality and reason. Um, and I'm not so this is just a background to your question. I'm, uh, I struggle with how we can understand the significance of emotion in this context without uh, returning to an enlightenment sort of binary of reason always being good and emotion being bad. So that's first of all. But the media education and media literacy strategies have always focused on a particular kind of critical inquiry that, that presumes we can um, figure out the, the truth of a fact or we can come to some sort of consensus. So where is media education gonna, going to go in giving given the challenges, um, including how do you discern whether it's, you know, who it's coming from, et cetera. Um, uh, I don't have a really easy answer to that. And I raise those questions about emotion and reason because I'm not sure how many new directions media education and media literacy can go beyond what we've done already. I mean, you and I can think together about what's necessary to determine whether what we're seeing is accurate or not. You know, what are the steps we can take? Um, so I could say more, but I bet a lot of folks here have ideas about, about strategies that would be important in your arena to address this. And I wonder if we want to pick up on, on that a bit before moving to other questions. Yeah? 
Uh, should I? Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I'm actually coming from Brazil, so that particularly resonates with me. We're going through a very similar situation. I have like tons of more important questions, but I'll try to focus on science. But yeah, keep an eye on the elections because this happens uh, everywhere. Uh, but uh, one thing that resonates with me is, is your your your, your the, the the whole post truth analogy, and the, there's too many facts, and you can pretty much speak to that. That is actually the fact with science as well. I mean, we just have too much science at the moment. Uh, and as much as we love open access uh, and open science and open contributions, that probably makes it even more wild and, and hard to distinguish. And like being in Brazil and being like in all of these political discussions with uh, in Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups with scientists, scientists do not seem to be very much better in telling fake news from real news so do you know of any seriously i mean uh, and that worries me because i mean that has to do with the shift sifting the evidence right uh, so i mean is are, are there any studies that like, try to compare scholars and like people from different uh, yes. occupations in terms of like how can they actually evaluate evidence both within and without science because i mean that's to me is a fascinating field of inquiry Yeah, um, are there studies showing how people evaluate? Oh, there's so much to say about it, and yet there isn't a, there isn't a magic bullet for this. And yes, there are studies. Um, there are starting to be studies about about these questions. Um, it's, I mean, it's a really fascinating issue because uh, you you could. One might imagine that a particular level of education would ensure that one has a capacity to discern uh, what you know the authenticity, um, and it's not necessarily the case. And part of it is about the aesthetics, about the um, the visuals of how this looks. I mean, the story that you were referring to today about um, the the domestic use of of uh, the same strategies that have been being used by the bad actors of Russia, et cetera. Now we're seeing those used domestically very effectively. And um, part of why I'm turning my research to examine the emotional components is because I'm wondering if media education and media literacy needs to be able to discern what's going on emotionally in terms of our desire to, as some of the activists were saying, to believe a particular thing and not another. So this is not an answer to your question. I think what I need to do is perhaps um, email your organization through Carly. I can email um, what we're starting to collect, where we're, um, my research team and I are trying to collect uh, all of the all of the manuals and uh, websites and resources about the, about precisely this about what does media education look like right now how can we discern this and there's th I just maybe folks here have some more pertinent uh, specific things you want to share about that since two of you have that concern yeah so you talk a lot about um, uh, emotion and reason, but there's the, the third domain, which is embodiment. And, and this is what uh, you know, qualitative research is all about, is trying to ground the, the discovery in an action. You know, and that's what the documentary tries to do and so on and so forth. And um, uh, I, I guess, uh, to a certain extent, the original idea of participatory democracy is to talk together, to embody ideas, mm -hmm. And so we're not necessarily rational actors. Mm -hmm. We are uh, we're uh, pragmatic uh, sort of approximators. You know, we're we're always trying to uh, go with our biases and change it if necessary. So so how do we move beyond this idea of uh, of, of science or emotion and go to be be scholarly ethnographers of of what's out there and share that in a in a more open way, I guess. Can you uh, just clarify, so you mean, how do we... Um... How, how do we have more citizen scholars who uh, don't just yell or don't just um, stand on a, on a bowl or something like that, they, they, they document. It's, so the documentarian there, how, how can you document in a way that it will be accessible to people who don't think like you? Well. I, I, if I understand what, what you're getting at, um, I'm, I've been thinking that we need to, to understand what is happening. Um, the, 
there, it's, it seems to be clearly the case that engaging, trying to engage some kind of dialogue through digital media, through my interaction with my computer, is uh, eliminating various aspects of the importance of embodied exchange. And I don't, I, I'm really curious to have some, some scholars um, do studies about what is the brain activity difference between this and engaging in this way. And so one of the hopeful points I might make about this is um, that the significance of movements like Occupy, which got so, uh, speaking of media representation, got so buried um, in, uh, and, and lambasted, really. But the, the fact of horizontal organizing um, and the desire to occupy public space and the desire to to be together in an embodied way and um, and and sort of pragmatically exhibit what uh, what a future world could look like right here was really really significant and so I I, I just want to echo I think you're onto something and I think that one of the really crucial things in this digital revolution period is figuring out how we're going to have these dialogues face to face. I mean, personally, as somebody who hails from the US, I'm wondering if I need to drop everything and move to the South and figure out you know, something like the Highlander Institute or you know, uh, how are we going to have these conversations across this polarized divide? Because it's very, very serious what's happening. And it's happening largely because of digital media. I'm, I'm convinced of that. OK, we have time for one more question. Um, I was just wondering in terms of, we've seen a lot of um, science used to, or pseudoscience used to, uh, reframe or misframe debates about, say, climate change and stuff like that. How do you think open access will change this going in the future? Will it make it, uh, will it amplify that? Will it make it easier for us to respond to people who are trying to distort science? I was just wondering what you think. Say, say a little bit more about your... Um your vision of what's going to happen. <laughs> um, I see a, a, it's hard, I can see it going both ways. I can see it getting very messy into the future before we, we actually come out the other end with something more concrete. It's like, I see us going through a very messy period right now with uh, social media. I think we will come out the other end, um, but we have to go through this, this kind of messy period for people to wake up and say, hey, you know, we need to, look after media sources. I think we will go back to things like uh, BBC, CBC, and say we need to start reinvesting in those because we can count on them. Yeah, um, given our time, I'll, I'll just make two points. One, I would recommend people check out the Oxford Internet Institute and um, uh, my colleague um, Phil, Phil Howard and Woolley, W-O-O-L-E-Y, um, they, they're studying junk science. They, they were one, some of the first people to recognize computational propaganda, and they're now focusing on junk science. So I think they would be a really interesting source to help you think through that. And um, uh, the other issue of, of returning to BBC, CBC. One of the things I, I've noticed in the whole Cambridge Analytica, Facebook scandal is that um, now uh, in trying to save face, uh, Facebook is, um, Facebook is, is trying to determine which news sources are, are um, acceptable, right? And so that's ending up returning us to traditional media, right, to the New York Times and the Washington Post, et cetera. My concern about that is that prior to the digital panoply and inundation that we have right now, I mean, my concern in 2000 and 2001, and if you read the intro of my book, Digital Media and Democracy, I mean, I, I um, tried to challenge Tim Russert, who was a big media guy on this, and got booed out of the audience. I mean, it was out outrageous. What I was saying at that time was, how can sources like the New York Times or Meet the Media with Tim Russert, how can you appear to be ignoring all of the international news about weapons of mass destruction um, and, and uh, purporting that, you know, that there are WMD, the point being, the kind of critical inquiry that we need to read these trusted sources like the Washington Post and the New York Times, I have seen debate about that kind of critical inquiry is gone now. We are not discussing the need to carefully um, uh, interpret 
the spin and uh, partisan perspectives of of the near of these traditional sources, right? So I'm I'm what I'm saying is I think there's a big concern in that we're going to return to having trust in particular sources without the kind of uh, critical awareness that's needed to even evaluate those trusted sources. So then it, it raises the question: Is public media one of the key answers is CBC and BBC, and I would I would agree. Yes, I think I think it is. And um, investigative journalism, I'm finding that investigative journalism is one of the primary places that I'm finding cutting edge information about these new areas of emotion and digital media that that folks are really uh, doing important work, and and it's coming out in a timely way. So how we can invest in public media, I think, is really crucial to perhaps to media and democracy and to open access. Yes.